lists require a different set of grammar than data frames or vectors. By the end of this lesson, you will be able to easily subset any list, named or unnamed. Many users find working with vectors and data frames fairly similar to how they interact with data in other programs. Unlike data frames and vectors, lists can store different data types. In this example, the list car called LO holds a data frame, which contains data about three birds. The next element in the list could be anything. It doesn't have to be another data frame. We could store a model or a plot here. For data frames, we can index two ways. First, we can use a pair of square brackets with the comma. Information about the rows goes on the left side of the comma. In this example, we are indexing the first row. On the right side of the comma is the information about the column. Here we are using the name of one of the columns. The second way to index data frames is with a dollar sign and the name of the column. List indexing is one key place where lists differ from data frames and vectors. List indexing uses square brackets, just like data frames and vectors, but in a different way. First, we can use double square brackets with a number to subset any list. Here we are subsetting out the second element of the LO list. Second, if a list is named, we can put the name of the element in the double square brackets to index a particular element. Here we are subsetting out the model element of the LO list. Let's walk through another example where we compare for loops and per functions to solve a problem. We want to know how many rows are in each element of a list. In this case, each element of our list, survey underscore data, is the results of two weeks of counts of frogs from wetlands on Lake Erie. Each element should have 14 rows, one row for each day in the two-week survey. To check on the number of rows in each element without per, we first create a new data frame to store our results in. This new data frame, called df underscore rows, has two columns, one called names, which contains the names from our list, and one called rows, which is currently empty. This is where we will put the output from our for loop. Then we write a for loop where each iteration takes the element from the list and puts it into the function n row. n row counts the number of rows in a data frame. The result from n row is put into the next row of the data frame in the rows column. This works fine, but leaves lots of room for typos and is a lot more code than we need. Now let's try to check the number of rows in each element of the survey underscore data list using the per function map. Remember that survey data is a list where each element is a data frame, and each should only have 14 rows. We will be using the map function to replicate the for loop from the previous slide. The map function takes two arguments. The first argument is the list object, in this case, the survey underscore data list. The second argument is the function we want to iterate each element through, in this, in this case, the n row function. We put the function after the tilde symbol. Then we put the dot x into the function to show map where we want to put the element to be inputted. One possible issue here is that the output of map is another list. When we solved this problem with a for loop, we got a data frame. We got our answer here, but it might not be the form we want. But before we learn how to get different outputs with per, let's have you take a swing at map 